Good morning and welcome to Science Farm Live. It is absolutely amazing to be back with you guys this morning. Um, if you were with us yesterday, I can't believe how amazing it was to see a lamb born live on camera in Wales. We've headed a little bit further east from Wales today. We're at Harper Adams, which is in Shropshire, and I am joined by Paula and Meg, who are two of um, the amazing engineers and researchers that work here at the university. Online, I understand that I'm joined by 46,000 of you guys, which is absolutely amazing. I can't believe, what a big classroom. Can you hear me at the back? Mm -hmm. um, and you're from countries, there's lots of you in England and Wales, we love that, but you're also in Scotland, Ireland, Albania, Ecuador, Australia, Cyprus, Poland, and the USA. Unbelievable that we're still going global with our British Science Week this week. Really, really exciting. So I'm just going to kick off with a few shout outs. We're going to do a few of these through the morning, but I'd love to do a big shout out to Year 4 Sutton on the Forest. Give me a wave and a cheer in the classroom if you can hear me. Year 6 pupils at Cop Lane. Uh, Birch class in Sea Scale Cumbria. You were one of the winners of our farm invention competition. Well done, you guys. Uh, Chester Community Primary School. Ripple Primary School, can you hear me? Uh, year six pupils from St. Michael at Bows in Palms Green. Rabbit class at Stout Stouting Primary School. I hope I pronounced that right for you guys. Wall Village Primary School. Halstow Primary School in East Greenwich, London. And Oscar, who's homeschooled in Anglesey in Wales. Fantastic. Shout out back to Wales yesterday, throwback already, and it's only Tuesday in the week. Fantastic. This is a wonderful location, and Harper Adams is full of an amazing future technology and research in the world of farming and agriculture. And what we're going to do today, we've got about 45 minutes to take you through some of the things that they're working on, things that they're researching. And Paula and Meg work in some fascinating areas. So what I'm going to do to start off with you for you today is I'm going to hand over to Paula, um, I'm going to let her explain a little bit about what she does here at the university and about what her research entails and then me and Meg are going to head inside and we're going to catch you in about 10 minutes time. So over to you Paula. Brilliant, thank you very much George. Hi, hello, my name is Paula. I'm a senior lecturer in soil and water management here at Harper Adams and I do quite a lot of teaching and research centred around soils. And soils, I'd like you to um, think about the importance of soils in terms of their health, in terms of their quality. So um, healthy soils are fundamental for, uh, for farming, as the healthier the soils are, the healthier our crops are going to be. And what is actually the role of soils in supporting uh, agricultural crops? So uh, soils provide agricultural crops with oxygen, nutrients, water and also physical support and overall there is a really a close link between healthy soils and healthy crop that we are able to to produce thinking about soils and how they actually develop um, soils form very very slowly um, and actually it depends on the climatic conditions so um, to create a centimetre of, of soil, it takes between 200 to 400 years, which means it's a very, very slow process and we need to make sure that we treat our soils as non-renewable resources because it's very easy to destroy soil and never get it back. So now I'd like us to have a quick look at different soil types. So soil types uh, differ in between continents, countries, districts, fields and also within one field. What I have here, I gathered some soils from our Harper Adams University farm. So it, we can see they definitely differ in colour, they definitely differ in the way they look. So uh, first of all I'd like us to have a quick look at this black soil. So it's a peat soil really the best soil we could we could um, we would like to have full of nutrients full of uh, nutrients that get released to our crops and are able to feed our crop and um, that's so that's the peat soil moving on um, an extremely different soil we can see it differs in color 
and it also differs in structure. And that's, uh, that's, that's actually pure sand, which, uh, we, which we have to use for growing crops as well. Okay, so pure sand, the, the main properties of pure sand would be uh, permeability. Pure sand has relatively large soil particles and as a result of that, water travels through the soil very, very quickly. So uh, sands tend to stay dry and don't really hold on to moisture and don't hold on to nutrients very well. So uh, when we farm in these type of conditions, we really need to uh, understand what our soils need to be able to produce a good crop. Moving on. This is a medium type of soil called a loamy soil. So it's a sun, actually a sandy loam. And I have two samples of sandy loam soil, which you can see here. And you can probably see a little bit of a difference in color. And you can probably see a lot of difference in structure. Um, I have to confirm that these two samples come from the same field. It's actually the field that we have here at the at the back where we are running a long-term experiment looking at the effect of soil compaction and tillage on crop production and also the environmental aspects. So these two soils come from the same field. This is the same soil type but they look very different. This soil has never been, has, has not been trafficked and tilled for the last 10 years. So it has developed really good structure. It can be broken up easily. We can see plenty of roots inside the sample. And if we, um, if we look closer, we can also see some earthworm channels and a lot of biological activities taking place in these conditions. So a really nice structure, good for moisture movement, for root development and um, as a result of that giving us a good quality and uh, high quantity crops. So the, 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 the other sample comes from the same field as we said but it comes from the gateway, the area that gets all the traffic, all the vehicle traffic accessing this particular field. So for the last 10 years we know its history, it's been trafficked a lot. And when we grab a clot of the soil, we can see it's much larger, doesn't break that easily. It's actually much wetter and you can see not many roots, not many biological activities. I can't see any earth, earthworm channels. It's really not a very good soil for uh, growing crops. It's been compacted too much. Okay, moving on to our last soil sample. It comes from, it's a, it's a clay sample, which, uh, which is much wetter. It is built up of um, very small particles, put quite closely together. And as a result of that, it's, uh, it holds on to moisture a lot, does not allow moisture to go through uh, the soil quite a lot. The good thing about this soil it is, is that it was actually collected from a, from a grassland field. So you can see quite a lot of um, vegetation, quite a lot of roots helping to structure that soil. And uh, so the soil is in a, quite a good condition because crops affect its structure, help to build up the structure. Which is, uh, which is really very useful. Okay, so if a farmer has these different, um, these dif these different um, soils on a farm or maybe a specific field, he needs to be able to um, recognize the difference. He needs to be able to decide how he should farm uh, his uh, soils because they require different management. So now I'd like us to talk about the types of vehicles used for uh, um, 
used on agricultural fields. You can see um, quite big tractors at, uh, at the back, uh, just behind me. So I'd like us to think about the amount of trafficking that these tractors do on an agricultural field. And uh, you should be able to see an image showing a typical amount of trafficking taking place on an agricultural field. Starting with, um, with soil preparation, then uh, planting a crop, then looking after that crop, so that's crop husbandry, and then uh, finally harvesting the field. So overall, there is a lot of trafficking that takes place and that affects the amount of compaction that we uh, find in our agricultural soils. Approximately, depending on the size of machines that we use, but around 85 to 100 percent of our field sees at least one pass of wheeling uh, within the growing season. Now I'd like us to have a quick look at a video of a um, um, modern type of tractor working on, uh, on actually this uh, experimental field conducting some tillage operations. So uh, what we can see, what actually happens that typically in, uh, on agricultural fields as they get trafficked on a yearly basis deep or at least shallow tillage operations are required on a, on, a, on, a, on a yearly basis. And when we have soft uh, soils that uh, have just been cultivated, if we apply any feather traffic to that soil, they actually get compacted. So if we come back and have a look at these two soils in a slightly more detail, what happens? So this has not been trafficked and compacted. This, has, this, uh, this soil has been trafficked and compacted for the last two, ten years uh, very significantly. So what's going, to, um, what's going to change? So first of all, there is the structure of the soil. It's the, the, uh, the arrangement of the soil particles. Then is the density. So this one is packed more. It's a denser soil in comparison to this one. The lighter soil, the, 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 the non-compacted soil, has larger pores. So it's oxygen, it's moisture, roots are able to grow through that soil much better. So that will result in a much better um, crop development, root development, higher quality and higher quantity yields. So, what can we do to actually prevent compacting our field? This is a question for you, so if you could uh, uh, direct your answers onto the chat, that would be really good. I will tell you a couple of ideas that I have that we could implement um, in order to um, reduce the amount of um, soil degradation, soil compaction problem in agricultural soils. So first of all is actually grabbing a spade, <laughs> grabbing a spade, uh, maybe grabbing a tool for assessing soils. Spade is a really a good starting tool to um, grab, grab a little bit of soil and see how it looks. I use a spade to uh, collect these samples and um, so it's understanding our soils and uh, testing them, knowing what they need, to, knowing what crops they can grow really well and what crops we should avoid. Then it's also the timing of operations. Our uh, weather conditions within a, uh, within a given year change. So we need to make sure that uh, we choose the right crops so we are able to plant them and look after them and then harvest them at the right time. If we tend to work with soils that are heavy and wet, we don't really want to um, grow crops that would need to be harvested late, close to winter time, because the soil conditions would not be really good. So it's the timing of operations and the choice of crops. Further, what we can do, 
we can uh, think of uh, trying to use smaller, smaller tractors, smaller vehicles. And my colleague uh, Meg is going to uh, talk to you about her work in the area of um, robotic uh, small uh, vehicles. Um, what else can we do? We could, for example, use uh, conventional tractors, but uh, make sure that they are actually used trucks rather than um, conventional tires, or maybe choose tires that are larger, are more flexible, and spread that high load from the, the, the tractor onto a larger area and compact the soil much less. What else can we do? There is a system called control traffic farming, which helps you to control your traffic. And uh, I would like you to uh, read up about it. It's a system that comes, uh, it originates from Australia, where they have large fields and they have larger vehicles. And the idea is to match the widths of all the vehicles used on a given field. And as a result of that, you have some permanent wheelways and you have some areas of the field that do not get trafficked. And initially, in the beginning, we said that typically 80 to 100% of the field gets traffic. In a controlled traffic farming system, it's about 15% of the area that get traffic. And the rest of the field looks like my middle sample. Um, here, it's not compacted, uh, develops a really good structure, and um, is much better for growing high-quality crops. Okay, so I've given you um, an, an idea on uh, what, we could, what we could do to look our, after our soils, to make sure that they uh, do not get compacted, we do not uh, uh, degrade them. We really need to make sure that we consider it on the long term because soils are fundamental for uh, producing our food and f feed, feeding us. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, pass you over to, to Josh. Thank you so much, Paula. That's so insightful and it's so important as well that we look after our soils. And we're going to see as well from Meg about what you're doing here at Harper Adams to combat some of the issues that you have sometimes with large machinery in a field. Um, it has been absolutely fantastic so far to be joining the lesson with you. Uh, I want to do a few more shout outs to start off with. So uh, year four at Whitchurch Primary School in Harrow. How are you doing? Fantastic stuff to have you. Hey on Y Primary School. I think we drove through there yesterday on the way to Wales. Aspire School in Paphos, Cyprus. Wow, all the way from Cyprus. Great to have you with us, guys. Uh, we've got Waterville Primary, South Avenue Primary School, Owls Class at Stebbing Primary School. I want to hear you nice and loud. Um, Paula, we've had some fantastic responses as well for people talking about what we could do about soil. Um, I think uh, well, one of our classes in Ecuador has said that they use um, ox um, on farm instead of tractors for planting sometimes. So amazing bit of insight there from the other side of the world. Um, we've got um, St Christopher's School have suggested we could maybe use drones. Um, we've also got making sure that machinery is light so the soil doesn't get compacted. Be interesting. And they've also suggested maybe use uh, narrow wheels and lighter vehicles. So I think some of that will definitely link back in. Uh, there's a couple of things that I forgot to tell you because I would normally get quite excited when we're doing these live lessons, everybody. So firstly, if you'd like a shout out, the last set of shout outs we do were actually live from the chat and you can interact with the whole of this live lesson through the YouTube chat function. So if you're at school, get your teacher to jump onto YouTube, start writing in the comments. If you're at home, you need to make sure you've got your parents' permission, get them to give you a hand, um, asking any questions you've got or if you'd like a shout out. Also, teachers, we are on Twitter, at NFU Education. We would love to see pictures of you joining in, especially you guys in Ecuador. I'd love to see a picture of you guys all the way over in Ecuador um, joining in with us here in Shropshire. Um, I wonder what the weather's like where you are. It's a little bit cloudy here, uh, maybe a little bit warmer, where, warmer in your location. Maybe you can see some ox out the window, I don't know. Um, but what a fantastic global event we're having this morning. Um, it certainly is the future, isn't it? Uh, what I'm going to do now is I am going to pass you back up into the engineering building, which is that way. Um, and we're going to join with Meg, who's going to talk to you about something called autonomous vehicles. So over to you, Meg. Yep. 
So, hi, thanks for that, Josh. My name is Megan Platt, and I'm here to talk to you about autonomous vehicles. So, autonomous vehicles are sometimes known as driverless vehicles, and what they do is they use lots of clever sensors and computers to replace the driver. So, why don't we try and think about what a driver needs to do when they're controlling a vehicle? So, for starters, they always need to look where they're going to make sure they don't crash into anything. They also need to control the steering of the vehicle to guide it to the best path and make sure that um, they go around corners correctly. They also need to speed up and slow down the vehicle at the correct times. They need to slow down when they're going around corners and also when they're going through wet areas. At the same time, they also need to know where they're heading to and they need to understand the route to get there. So if you guys can think of anything else, just type it into the YouTube chat, just anything you can think of that a driver needs to do to drive a car that isn't the one I've just listed. And we can get back to it in a minute or two. So what we need to do is we need to replace all of these actions with cameras and computers and sensors. So instead of a person looking, what we do is we have clever sensors. Here, I have a camera not too dissimilar to the cameras that you probably have at home. And I've also got a little LiDAR here. Now, a LiDAR is something that measures the distance. So, Josh, if you would like to come in for your little demo. This is my, I love, I love a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> this is my fabulous <laughs> assistant, Josh. <laughs> if I just refresh the page. There we go. I think we should warn people that I was crashing these this morning. So, right now, we have a little robot here. And on top of the robot, it has both a camera and a LiDAR. And as you might be able to see, there's a little map being created by the LiDAR as the vehicle travels round. So the LiDAR measures distance to an object, and then it knows, Josh... I've knocked the robot over. <laughs> I told you you shouldn't trust the robot. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. So what the robot's doing, it's measuring distance to all the objects around it, and it's creating a little map out of that data, as you can see that it's building it up there as it goes. So if we link back to um, what I said before about what we need to replace, we also need to replace steering the vehicle. So instead of a person steering a steering wheel, what we use in autonomous vehicles is a motor that turns the wheel for us. And when we um, speed up and slow down the vehicle in the car, we use foot pedals. But with autonomous vehicles, what we do is we use wire signals to tell the vehicle to speed up or slow down or apply the brakes. And instead of a person knowing what route they're going to take, what we do is we have computerised maps within the computer on the, on the vehicle. You're having fun, Josh? Oh, I'm having so much fun with this. It's <laughs> the best fun I've had in a long time. These are amazing in robots. <laughs> So just like a Google Maps or a sat-nav that you might have at home, what we do is we, um, there's a computerised map in there and the vehicle knows how to follow that map. So if I might ask Josh to look at the YouTube channels and see if anyone put anything that they okay, noticed. My, my uh, little tablet here is vibrating. We'll see if we've got <laughs> any, uh... Oh yeah, okay. So okay. we've got, let's have a look. Um, we've got Dexter says they need to stay on the route. They do, so that's why we use lots of other sensors, including the camera, that can also see what route the vehicle needs to travel down, as well as the LiDAR. Definitely a good to know where you're going. It is. Canich Bridge Primary, hello guys. They say that they need to have hazard perception. Hazard perception, well, that's included with the camera and LiDAR, always noticing the object. There's some other things as well. For instance, when you're driving a car, you sometimes need to communicate to the other drivers, don't you? You do things like indicators and handways. And when it comes to autonomous vehicles, that is one of the most complex and difficult things for us to do. Indicators are quite easy, but hand signals would be very difficult for a robot to do. Definitely, and then said, since someone else is here said, um, I think this is also from Canich Bridge Primary, so I think you're on it. If it is, if it's someone else, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it says a driver needs to control the speed, yes. Mm -hmm. Switch headlights on when it's dark. So oh, that's true. That they can kind of think about, and also avoid obstacles. Yes, avoid obstacles. So like I said before, with the camera and LiDAR, it knows where an object is, and then for we can use the motor control, the steering, to go around the object. With turning on and off the headlights, we sometimes have little light sensors. You might have seen them on like top modern vehicles. They have a little light sensor on the front of it, and it dims the lights automatically when there's a car coming the other way. So why do we want autonomous vehicles in farming? That's the next question. So when it comes to farming, oh, when it comes to farming, um, I'm sorry, I, can I? It's all right, when it comes to farming, it's like, this is live, everybody, it's great. <laughs> you stop, you start, and you go back in, that's the nature of it, and I think everyone will agree as well, Meg is doing an amazing job telling Thank us about you. this. It's such an exciting moment. <laughs> so, autonomous vehicles in farming. So, labour in farming can be really quite expensive, and 
what we've seen in farming these days is that vehicles are growing absolutely massive to accommodate this. I think I've got a picture of some very big vehicles about to show up on the screen. And the thing is, is that a person, one person in a big vehicle can do as much work as two or three people in smaller vehicles. So that's why these vehicles are getting an awful lot bigger. Labour and farming is quite difficult to find these days because it's a very difficult seasonal job and also you need to be able to operate all the farm machinery, which not many people know how to do. Um, as well as that, um, so yeah, we use autonomous vehicles in farming to try and replace all of those issues. Sorry. It's all right, keep going. <laughs> You hand it back to me now? Um, no, I'll kind that's of, all right. maybe for a brief second. Is that that's all right? Back. Yeah, that's all right. So I'm just going to hand back for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few more shout outs. Meg's just going to set, set the place? robots back up for us as well, because we've had a bit of a, what you can't see around her feet is that she's almost going to get run over. So what are we like? I'm going to give you a few shout outs and let's see how we're getting on. Here we go. So, oh my gosh, there's so many of you guys. It's so amazing to have you all on here. So we have got, I'm going to do some more shout outs. I'm going to do orange class. Wells Park School, great to have you with us. Miss Barrett's class year six at Layer School. Happy Science Week. We haven't even mentioned that it's Science Week this week. What a Science Week. Key Stage 2 at Lavender Primary School and St. Peter's C of E Primary in Ashton. I want the whole of Ashton to hear you giving us a massive cheer as I hand back over to Meg. <laughs> so sorry about that few difficulties there. Right, so... When it comes to big vehicles in farming, there are some more issues other than just the things we talked about before. So Paula, my lovely colleague who spoke to you before, she mentioned all about soil compaction and how that affects soil health. And the bigger the vehicle is, the heavier it is and the more compaction it causes. So another thing with um, big vehicles is that they tend to have a very big area of contact with the field. So I think I've got a video of um, a boom sprayer here. And as you can see, it's absolutely massive, very long arm, covers a lot of the vehicle. And the thing is, all the plants underneath, they're all treated the same. Whereas really, plants are individual and they all need treating differently. So this is why we use autonomous vehicles in farming, because autonomous vehicles, we can make them very, very small, and we don't have to worry about the labour for driving those vehicles. Because they're so small, they can get down to the level of the plants, they can give individual care to each plant. And yes, I think that's my bit over. I'm going to hand you back over to Josh, if that's all right, Josh. Yeah, absolutely, Megan. Can I just say, <laughs> we've got so many comments on the chat yeah. saying what a great job that you're doing. So it's absolutely fantastic. I think everyone will agree. I mean, she programs robots and she can present to you guys. She's amazing. <laughs> right, okay. Now you guys are going to be stuck with me for a few minutes. This is where the chaos really begins. As always, in the NFU Education Department, I'm going to take a step this way as well because I have been reminded to social distance. So we're going to make sure we keep that two metres apart. Um, on your screen, in one second, you are going to see a slate that is going to be up for around a minute while we do a bit of backstage magic here. Um, to show you our precision weeding activity. So that slate's going to come up now. If you've got all the things, if your teacher is super organised and ready, well done, that teacher. If you haven't got a chance to get all these random items out, and I won't be surprised if you haven't, seen it's only the second day since you guys have been back at school. So I hope you're being nice to your teachers. Um, and you can have a go at this activity at home, or you can have a go of this activity maybe later on during Science Week. So that slate's going to come up on the screen now, and then I'm going to talk to you all about how we can replicate precision weeding at school or at home. <laughs> Let's leave, yeah, just move out of the way slightly. Right, okay. And just let me know when you're ready now, Rox. Give me a countdown. Okay, we're back here. As you can see, I've kind of matched up what should have been on your screen before. And I'm going to talk to you all about kind of how you can think about precision weeding. So often when we do something to show a concept in science, 
we might do kind of a bit of a, a metaphor of what's happening. So my metaphor is that I've got one of these beautiful plates available from a Swedish furniture store <laughs> that I will not name. Um, in fact, I've got two of them. And this is my field. On this plate here, and I'm not going to tip it too much because nobody wants peas and sweet corn on the floor. I have got these peas and sweet corn. Now, for the purpose of this activity, we are going to say that the sweet corn is our crop. We're going to say that the peas are some pesky weeds that we don't want there. And we're going to think about how we could remove those. So if you want to think in the chat, how might, how might a farmer remove some weeds? There's different ways of doing it. There's different tools to do that. So to replicate that, we are going to choose some tools to try and remove the weeds. I'm going to give you a limited time to do that, around 30 seconds. And we're going to try and remove those weeds. I'm going to put them on the other field over here, my other little frisbee type plate going on. So I chose a random selection of tools. OK, I've got this brilliant unicorn spatula. I was in big trouble with my three-year-old for taking that this morning. We've got one of these things, bashing stuff in the kitchen, a set of chopsticks, a spoon, a set of toy pliers, a clothes peg. So have a quick think. I'm going to give you about ooh, 20 seconds in your class. Which do you think of these would be the best tool for the job? Or more to the point, which one do you want to see me trying to use? To move as many of the green peas without damaging the sweet corn as possible. Because you've got to think about this for farmers, OK? If you want to remove a weed, you do not want to damage your crop at the same time. That's a really, really important thing we've got to think about. And that is what precision agriculture is all about. How do you remove things like weeds and pests without damaging the environment around them and damaging your crop? Two really important points. I wonder if I can see if anybody's chosen a tool yet. I'm going to have a quick look on the, on the live feed that I'm getting from the amazing team at Encounter Edu, who I'm just going to shout out to the Encounter Edu guys. They have been fantastic this week. Um, linking us up yesterday, especially in Wales, in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I think I'm getting something through. You're going to lose your chance and I'm going to pick. Oh, right, OK, people are saying uh, in actual practice that people might use a herbicide, so something that removes the, the weeds chemically. You could hand weed. That sounds very, very tiring. Set of tweezers. That sounds even more tiring than the hand weeding. Um, and also maybe a trowel or a spade. Right, apparently it's a, a toss-up here between me either using the hammer or the chopsticks. I thought it might go that way. I love it. Right, um, right. let's do a quick... We're going to do the hammer second, for obvious reasons, I'm sure you know at home. But this is a test of my chopstick skills. But I want to see in the chat... How many do you think, with my precision skills, with this set of chopsticks, the ladies and gentlemen, this came from, these came from Vietnam on my holidays. Fantastic. Our amazing tech team are going to put a timer up. They're going to give me a thumbs up when the timer starts. I'm going to need all of these 30 seconds. And we'll see how many of these peas can we remove. Oh, I've got a thumbs up. Right, here we go. We're on. This is definitely don't take me to a... Oh, I'm getting better. I am getting better. Oh, careful of the crops around. That was awful. We've got one so far. I hope someone's going to tell me when to stop. Well, this is going to be a very long live lesson this morning. Here we go. Oh, yeah, see? Right, I doubted myself. That's a lesson to all of you. Ten seconds? Ten seconds? Five. Four. Four. Is he going to get another one? No. Three. Oh. Right, so I managed to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not a bad score. I want to know on Twitter later today how many of you can beat eight with a pair of chopsticks i'm going to be looking out for those tweets and i'm hoping to see them everybody right should we go i'm not even going to do 30 seconds of the hammer because i'll probably be banned from harper adams university for the rest of my life and they're really great here we've got loads of really exciting projects we've planned with them this year so i'm not going to ruin their engineering lab but this is actually a really good way to think about soil compaction and actually what happens if you use an ineffective tool. And I love the fact that Simon, our camera guy, is just looking at me with a camera waiting for the chaos. So if I tried to destroy a weed, to pick a weed with this, right, I'm gonna, first I'm going to see if I can pick them up. Not a chance. Now what you could do is you could try and smash the weed. So let's have a go at that. Yeah, great, look at that. And you can see, yes, you have destroyed some of the weed, 
But what you've also done is you've damaged the crop around it. And the other thing is if we were outside on Paula's field, by hitting down on something like soil, you would be compacting it. And that's one of the most important things that we've got to avoid as farmers is that soil compaction. We need to make sure that anything we do in terms of removing weeds is not going to have a negative, a negative impact on the soil. So this is a rather strange set of tools that I've got here. What I want to do, because you've already seen how amazing Meg is already, I'd like to invite her back because for the next segment, she's going to tell you about a tool that she's designing with her colleagues here at Harper Adams that is a way of weeding without even touching the weed at all. It's seriously sci-fi. I'm going to do a weird removal here with the whole table. Let's see if I drop it. And back to you, Meg. All right. Thank you, Josh, for that introduction. So I'm here to talk to you about precision tools in farming, but most particularly for weeding. So let's go right back to the beginning. What is a weed? Quite simply, a weed is just a crop, a plant that's growing in the wrong place. So last time you were outside, I bet you guys probably saw quite a lot of weeds. There's lots of common weeds in the area. We've got, in the UK, we have things like dandelions and nettles and thistles. And these weeds can cause a problem to farmers. So for example, if you've got a big field, crop of field, field of crops, and you've got weeds growing in there, they will compete for the nutrients and the light and the soil with the crops in there, which isn't very good at all. Think about like dandelions in the grassland pasture. Um, we've also got things like, if you're a farmer, would you really want to be working in an area that's full of thistles and nettles? If anyone been stung by a nettle before, you know that it hurts, and the farmer would rather not have to deal with them when, when he's working. And there's also things like ragwort. Now, ragwort is a bright yellow flower. You might have seen them before, but the thing is, is that they can be poisonous to animals. So if a hungry sheep or a hungry cow comes by, they might just end up eating it, and that wouldn't be very good at all. So there's also the issue where when it comes to harvesting your crop, if you've got too many weeds in there, then those weeds will go into the food and then you can't even use that food at all and you'd have to throw it all away and that's just not very good at all. So this is why when it comes to farming, we really want to keep the number of weeds as low as we possibly can. Now then, that doesn't necessarily mean that all these plants are bad. If we speak to an ecologist, now an ecologist is someone who looks at the relationship between plants and animals and all these things in the area, and they think that things like dandelions and thistles are really very good because bees and butterflies love the nectar in dandelions. At the same time, butterflies like laying their eggs in nettles. And thistles, after they've had a purple flower that the butterflies and the bees eat, what tends to happen is that they go to seed and then the birds eat the thistle seeds. So, as you can see, when it comes to places where the ecologist works, like wildflower meadows or forests or things like that, those types of plants are not necessarily weeds because they're needed there, they're wanted there. So we want to keep the number of weeds in some areas very low, like the farmer's fields, but in other areas, we want quite a lot of them to help for the local ecology. So what farmers tend to do these days is they use something called herbicides. Josh mentioned that before. What herbicides is, is a special chemical it's sprayed all over the field and it kills just the weeds, but doesn't harm the crop. Now, this is a very good way to keep the number of weeds low in the field, but sometimes the herbicides get out of the field through water and things like that. So when water runs through the field, it picks up the herbicide and carries it with it. And it will take it to places like forests and marshes and wildflower meadows where we kind of want these weeds to grow for the bees and the butterflies. So, this is why something called organic farming is coming into play. So organic farming is a special type of farming where you um, don't use or use very little chemicals on your field. But the thing is, is that if you've ever been to a supermarket, have a look out for any organic food because there is some in there, but you might find that there is a big price difference. Organic farming is a very expensive way to farm because all these things where you would use chemicals like herbicides or pesticides, that's chemicals that kill bugs, you have to replace that by doing things by hand usually. And like we were saying before about using tweezers to pick out every single weed, it would be a very, very time consuming job. So our job as agricultural engineers, we're, sorry, my microphone then, sorry. We're trying to find new and innovative ways to try and farm without harming the environment, but it's also cost effective. So one of the ways that we're looking at right now, a very precision tool is laser weeding. So if I can just get you guys to have a little look here, this is our example laser weeder. Now this works in a field 
put one, a lettuce field. And the thing is with lettuce fields, the lettuces are quite big and the weeds are quite small. So this does something very clever. It looks for the size of the crop, the size of the plant, I should say, and zaps only the small ones, as you can see there. So do you want me to do that again? Yeah. And it's also been told to ignore blue things. So blue things represent things like rocks or, you know, pebbles, something that would get in the way. There we go. So that's a very, very precise tool there used for weeding. And I think we've also got a video clip of the actual laser weeder in action. So this one is perfectly safe. It's just a little laser that you might have at home. You might have seen them before. And, but the laser weeder that we use to kill weeds is very, very dangerous. It'll burn someone's skin if it touches them, and it might even blind them if it goes into their eyes. So what we do is we put this big metal cover over the top of the weed to make sure it's very safe for people to use. So I think on the video you might have seen, going across the, the top of the screen, that there was a live feed of the, what the camera sees and what the computers see of the field and as you can see it's picking out these great big blobs they're lettuces and it knows not to touch them and it zaps just the tiny tiny weeds nearby so what was i talking about before sorry guys uh, my head's all over the place at the moment so yeah with oh my god my mind's gone blank with laser weeding we zap just the weeds and nothing else and I think, yeah, I think that's everything. It's a very, very precise tool, much better than Josh with the hammer, I'm guessing, as you know. <laughs> and it doesn't use any um, herbicides at all. So it's counted as organic farming because there is no chemicals being used here. So back to you, Josh. Thanks so much. Mike. I love how Meg as well, you just say just laser weeding. I mean, <laughs> we just get a laser. I mean, it's that simple. Like, <laughs> the work that goes on here at Harper Adams to have this kind of technology to help protect the environment, protect soils, is absolutely crucial for the future of food and farming. And then when you take something like that and you put it on one of those autonomous robots, you're, we're definitely looking at the farm machines of the future. Right, guys, I know I'm aware we're a little bit running over time. So if you do need to leave us now at the 45 minute mark, that's absolutely fine. But we have got so many questions for you guys. We are definitely just going to continue. We're going to give you another kind of 10, 15 minutes of questions. If you want to stick with us, pop them in the chat, pop them on the Twitter. We'll try and get through as many of them as we can. So I'm going to invite Paula back on as well. Um, just as she's coming in, I'm going to give a few more shout outs. Uh, Stevenson Memorial, year four. Hi to everyone at Port Patrick Primary. Shout out to Kennet Primary School. Shout out to South Moor Primary School. Oh, you're in Scotland. I won't do a Scottish accent. I'll embarrass myself. <laughs> Hello from Coppice Primary School. Um, 6H at St. Winifred's in Manor Park, London. And hello to everyone at Wells Park Primary School, Otter Class Newport Primary, Essex, Belmont Junior 4M and 4D, and Mrs. Hamilton's class at 6HX at HTG. There we go. That's as many shouts <laughs> as you're going to get from me today. Don't put any more of those in the chat because I might run out of breath. Uh, so we've got some fantastic questions coming. Some of you have pre-submitted these. Please do keep putting them in, in the chat as well. Um, let's have a look at some of the questions that we've got on here. So I'm going to give Meg a little bit of a rest. I think you'll all agree <laughs> she's done a great job and has had lots to do. Um, so uh, Paula, top tip then from a machinery designer looking to improve soil health. And that's from South Wilford Primary School. First of all, I would say it's really working closely with farmers, working, working closely with advisors and practitioners because machinery manufacturers are, are amazing at designing machines, but really understanding the needs and understanding what these machines will be doing is the linkage which sometimes is missing, I think. Brilliant. Um, Meg, question for you. Do yes. you have to code the robots? If so, what program do you use? And that's from Ryder Hayes Primary School. That's a great question. That is a great question. Thank you for that. So it depends entirely on the robot. So some robots do some things and some robots do others. So we use lots of different programs on it. The little red robots you saw there, they use something called ROS. And ROS is actually not a program, it's a middleware. And it just helps all the little centers of computers all communicate together. But there's other things like um, the hands-free farm guys. You may have seen a video there on my... Um, of autonomous tractor driving and what they do 
is they use um, smaller computers. They might use Arduinos. If you guys have used Arduinos before now, they are quite common in schools, and that's the thing we also use in work. Amazing. Paul, a question for you from Oakdale Junior School. How has farm technology advanced in your lifetime? Good question. Good, really good question. I think, um, thinking about uh, my lifetime and thinking about the last even 10 and 20 years, we moved on from uh, small, simple tractors onto large machinery with loads of technology, a lot of technology that, uh, that um, supports farmers in a really nice and friendly way of uh, producing high quality crops. Brilliant, thank you so much. Uh, Megan, question for you from Hatcham Temple Grove. Um, when do you think then these autonomous robots might be starting use for farming in the UK widespread? Oh, widespread. So we do have a few autonomous um, robots being used for farming now, but they're in very small, very isolated places. And they're really just for the, us engineers to sort of get to know them and try and improve them. But I think that autonomous vehicles in farming will probably come before autonomous driving on roads. This is because there's lots and lots of safety issues involved with driving on roads that's not quite as much when you're in a field. So I think probably five to ten years maybe when we'll have autonomous vehicles in farming Amazing. widespread. You heard it here first. <laughs> few years time, once you guys are leaving secondary school, you're going to be looking out in the fields. I wonder what you're going to see. Um, <laughs> Paul, a question for you from Canic Bridge, Bridge School here. Um, they think if they have bad soil, how could, you make, how could they make their soil better for growing if they want to improve it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for this question. So we're improving soils. It's a, it's a long process. It does not take a year or two to, uh, to develop your soil. It's really a very long process. And what we can do, first of all, is really the crop choice. So uh, choosing crops with a range of rooting patterns and depths and then also uh, thinking about tillage techniques, making sure that we incorporate or leave plenty of so vegetation on the soil surface. So if we, have, if we start having good soil biology, the uh, little insects and earthworms will be working on, on this vegetation, uh, converting it into organic matter and slowly improving the soils but it's a long process of 10 years plus. Fantastic and we've talked about that word tillage could you give like a really simple explanation of what tillage is if, for the students at home? Okay so thank you so tillage so uh, yes so typically we want to prepare our soil for uh, uh, planting a crop and there are kind of two areas where we can think of tillage so it's a, a mechanical tillage or a biological tillage. So uh, starting with a mechanical tillage, it's, um, it's a tool which mixes the soil, picks, lifts it up, kind of uh, rearranges it, levels it off, so the soil starts having better porosity, is, is better aerated and it's... Is that the kind of thing we call a plough? Yes, or, yeah. so we could use a plough yeah, to cultivate, our, to till tool, our yeah, soil. If we're talking about mm -hmm. something that people might have heard of before, then yeah. An example of a tillage tool could be a plough, but obviously I know there's lots of other methods as well. Exactly, that's true. And then about, so how can we do that in an organic way? Then you talked about bio, uh, so, bio Yes, a, so a kind of biological yeah, tillage biology, is uh, really using, um, using cover crops, planting crops which are not necessarily cash crops, but crops that uh, gain leaf plenty of crop residue, um, structure the soil and help it to, uh, to kind of break and aerate in a natural way. Fantastic. So actually sometimes you might go past a farm and you might see a field full of what you think might look like weeds or wildflowers, but a lot of the time farmers are deliberately planting those kinds of crops to improve their soil health and that's what's so amazing that actually there's some there's some techniques out there that have been used for thousands of years at the same time as these brand new techniques that the guys here at Harper are coming up with using autonomous robots and lasers. <laughs> um, quick one for you, Meg. Yes. Uh, do robots or the machines frighten wildlife or livestock on the farm? Do your robots scare cows? Well, so we have certain issues. So we have something called Robo Chicken. That's a project we've been working on before. And it is literally a robot chicken. And <laughs> the thing is, Robot Chicken was designed because when you go into a big shed full of chickens, the chickens 
react to people. They don't like them, they're a little bit scared of them. And we found that replacing that with a robot means that the chickens are actually much less scared of the robots than they ever would be people. This causes some other problems where you have to make sure you can go around the chickens that don't seem to care too much whether they're going to get run over by a robot or not. I've just had a question here from Jenny Abbotts. We're worried that the robots might take over. I'm now worried that the robot chickens might take over. <laughs> um, that, yeah, woof. I came in this morning thinking we were talking about weeding and now I'm leaving scared of robot chicken world domination. <laughs> wow, right, let's have a look if we've got any more questions. So many questions coming from you guys. I'm going to give you five more minutes of questions and we're going to have to stop here. Um, let's have a look. I'm going to see if we've got some, so many great ones here. Um, I'll put this to both of you. We've got an idea all the way from Ecuador, guys, um, for a robot. Could you create a robot that when it sees a plant that's almost dead, it warns its owners or adds chemicals or something out, fertilizer to fix the plant? Yeah, so I certainly would say that's possible. So like I said before, robots use things like cameras. And if a person can see that this plant looks a bit unhealthy, then a robot will probably be able to tell, yes, this plant looks a little bit unhealthy. It might even be able to diagnose what's wrong with it, whether it's lacking in water or lacking a certain nutrient. And then it will spray just directly for that one plant that needs it. OK, I'm going to give you two more questions. So the first one's to both of you. Um, Deanfield Community Primary. What farming robot do you wish you could invent? So if you had an unlimited budget, uh, we won't tell Harper Adams about university <laughs> about your unlimited budget. If you had an unlimited budget to create a farming robot, what would it be and what would it do? And I'm going to ask that to both of you. I think that's a great question from Dean Field there. Shall I go first? I think I would recommend you go first. Okay. <laughs> so one thing that I would really like to see is a drone, but a drone that can carry a person. So drones are being used in farming a little bit more. They're mainly used for sensors to have a look at things. They can scan areas and see what's going on. But a farmer likes being in contact with the field. They like seeing the field. So why not have a drone that you can also carry the farmer to have a look as well? That's, that's what I would really like to see. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Paula? Mm -hmm. mm. I think I would, uh, I would uh, follow Meg's area in terms of going towards uh, the drone, uh, drone sector. I would still like to see drones being able to uh, inform farmers on problems and kind of to actually carry more technology, more sensors in the future. And of course it helps with the soil compaction thing as well, because you can't compact soil from a drone. Exactly. That's true. <laughs> Amazing. There we go, that's one for the future then as well. Absolutely fantastic, and yet there's so many brilliant examples already of drones being used in farming. I saw an amazing drone a few months ago that's able to plant trees from the air. Phenomenal. Um, final question, I'm going to give it to you Meg. How do you make the lasers and how long does it take to zap a field? And that's from Archie in Watford. Well, we personally don't make the lasers. We buy them from a company because that's a very, very specific, very, very difficult job to do. So in terms of zapping a whole area, what we try and do is the weed actually takes quite a while. The video that we showed you before where you know, the weeds disappear in a big puff of smoke, that's a bit longer than what they would normally take because we wanted to get that big puff of smoke. But in reality, it takes about three seconds, two seconds to focus on the weeds and make it disappear. For a whole field, that would take a very, very long time. And what we try and do is we try and specify the just weeds that would be very difficult to get mechanically with the laser instead. So if you think about big field of crops, a, a tractor can come through, it can weed the areas in between the rows of crops quite easily. But the ones that are very close to the crop itself, that's going to be very difficult to get. And they're the ones we focus the laser on to make sure that we can do the whole field. Amazing, thank you so much. I want to take this opportunity to give a huge thanks both to Meg and Paula. I want all of the streets around <laughs> all 46,000 of you to be able to hear the sound of cheers and clapping now in classrooms, please, because they've done a fantastic job. Now, a few things for you guys to do before I sign off. Firstly, popping up on your screen in a second is an activity that you can do at school or at home. You can actually go ahead and now I'd love to see you guys design your own future farming robots and then once you've done that send them to us you can send them in on the twitter at nfun education uh, we've also got if you want to email them to us they're education at nfu.org.uk um, but have a think think about what you've learned and how you can apply that into your own robot design and maybe we'll see you one day here at harper adams studying the amazing future farming robotic options that they've got. There's so many different courses that you could do here to help you create the farm of the future. That would be great to see you here and follow that career path. 
If you're also interested in that kind of thing, and we're just going to pop another screen up in a second, we have got an amazing competition going on at the moment at NFU Education. It's called Farmvention. You can find it at www.farmvention.com. And our challenge this year is to come up with an innovation or invention that can help farmers fight climate change and protect the environment. Now, I would say this morning, you've had a pretty unique insight and bit of inspiration there into an invention you could come up with and that Paula and Meg could actually help you out and help your school win a thousand pounds for your school to get some more STEM equipment and as well to join us at an amazing and award ceremony as well for the winners. So that's a fantastic opportunity. Have a look at that. It doesn't close till the 31st of May 2021. So you've got a couple of months to have a look get involved, get stuck in, really exciting project. If you go on the website as well, there's loads of really great 3D, 3D tours, uh, including one of a robotics laboratory for the small robot company who they started with an idea that was actually developed right here at Harper Adams. All I've got left to do today is to say a huge thank you for all of you to wa for watching. Uh, I'm hoping that some of you might join us tomorrow morning to see some chicks hatching up in Sheffield with our friend Debs at Ed Egg Education. Um, there's so many potentials for puns for that that we'll get into tomorrow, I'm sure. But thank you very much for watching, and we will see you tomorrow morning in Sheffield. Have a great British Science Week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>